Ladies and gents, welcome to a great evening. If you're looking for a world of gumshoes, wise guys, gorgeous dames, and dirty rats, kick back and enjoy. Welcome to Full Moon Matinee. Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, the detective, conducting investigations into the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. Tonight's picture is from 1955, Chicago Syndicate, starring Dennis O'Keefe, Allison Hayes, and Abby Lane. Now, Dennis, uh, in tonight's film, he's playing the role of Barry Amsterdam. Dennis O'Keefe uh, began his, he's the son of Irish immigrants who came over in, in early part of the 20th century and had a vaudeville act. And that's where he began his acting career, was really as a child actor in his parents' vaudeville act. But by the 1930s, he had moved into film uh, and played in a number of works under the name Bud Flanagan. But in 1937, he was signed to a contract with MGM, who renamed him to Dennis O'Keefe. He played in a lot of comedy movies, but he also had numerous roles in, uh, he would often play the tough guy in crime dramas and film noir. Now, in tonight's picture, uh, you will see, uh, certainly at the beginning of the film and other scenes throughout the movie, you will see that we have plenty of that voiceover narration, which was a classic element uh, for crime dramas and film noir of the era. So, from 1955, Chicago Syndicate. Let's roll the picture. Chicago, hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of big shoulders. Those are the proud words of Carl Sandburg. It's how we like to think of our city. Underneath the carpet of our complacency and inertia, was the dirt which had caked up again since Al Capone, Mr. Big, was put out of circulation. We'd fooled ourselves into believing that the air was fresh and pure again. But all that had happened under Mr. Big was small potatoes compared to the syndicate which had taken over the mantle of crime and corruption on a nationwide scale. As I learned when Nelson Kern paid me a visit. This time, they were hiding behind a phony veneer of legitimate enterprises. And it wasn't long after Mr. Kern left my office 
when it all started again. I knew for certain that Kern hadn't lied to me, that they were back in business, bigger and dirtier than ever, a malignancy that would have to be cut out at the core. By nightfall, it was all over town. The radio and the newspapers were full of it. Nelson Kern, respected head of the highly successful accounting and business management firm, Kern Associates, by his own admission to David Healy, editor of the Chicago Telegraph, branded himself a close working associate of Arnold Vallant, alleged head of Chicago's vast crime cartel. Later that night, Mrs. Kern committed suicide. She left a note for her daughter, Joyce Kern, living in France the last four years, engaged to some guy in the State Department. You know, usual thing. Crowds, newspapers hounding her, couldn't face the scandal. Disgrace. By the next morning, the news services were giving us the story on Joyce Kern. She had disappeared from Paris, was rumored to be on her way to a sanitarium in Switzerland. Her fiancé's family issued a formal statement for the press. If there had ever been an engagement, it was all off now. That was it. 30. afternoon, I met with a group of men at one of the Loop Hotels. They were quite a collection. Clarence Haynes, who was Kern's lawyer. Henry Nugent, owner of one of our largest department stores. Sam Landell, one of our foremost business executives. Harold Unkers, president of a utility company. Detective Lieutenant Robert Fenton. He'd fought the mob in the old days and hated their guts. And Pat Winters, state attorney and Illinois' leading crime buster. Kern was hired by Unicorn Casualty in Life. The insurance company that occupies the building on Clark Street? Right. He told me he discovered it was just a legitimate front for all of Valen's illegitimate enterprises. The more Kern saw, the dirtier he began to feel. He felt he had to wash his hands for the sake of his family as well as himself. Why did he go to you? Well, he said Valen had a lot of friends in the right places. He wanted me to front for him, act on his behalf in making a deal with the federal and state authorities and make sure the police guaranteed his family the maximum protection possible. Mr. Winters. Yes, sir? Seems to me the Attorney General's office should be able to do something. Well, we can't build a case without evidence, and that isn't easy to come by. Sure, the big dough still rolls in from gambling, shakedowns, vice, all the other rackets, but what happens to the money? For every illegal operation, the syndicate has a dozen legitimate fronts. So, a little of the take drifts into this business and a little into that. Pretty soon, it's like trying to separate sewer water from the ocean. Well, what do you suggest, Dave? That we pack up and move? Not if you're willing to open your checkbooks and take a gamble. Just what's on your mind? Some information came in this morning that we may be able to hang our hats on. We know who killed Kern. That is, who pulled the trigger. A kid found the gun this morning on a piling. It belonged to a hood by the name of Mel Burke. He's one of Valance boys. Did you arrest him? No. I sent out a tracer on him without telling anybody why. But even when I do find him, I'm not going to pick him up. We ask him not to. You see, if we pick up Burke, we get ourselves one small fry. He means nothing. We think we may be able to use this information as bait for the big fry. You understand this is all under wraps, of course. That's why I called you all together. We've got an opportunity to break the syndicate. But it'll take money. 
I've already contacted the other newspapers. They're willing to cooperate to clean out this element. So you can see I'm here as a representative of all the dailies. First time we've ever agreed on anything. <laughs> That's quite true. <laughs> well, I'm sure money will be no problem. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. You'll be apprised of everything we do when it happens. Gentlemen, I uh, suggest we leave one at a time. Thirty-six, single, background, attended Northwestern University to prepare for CPA career. Took business administration, commercial law to get his Bachelor of Science. Two years as infantry officer during the war, four major campaigns, decorated twice. Wounded, transferred to Judge Advocate's office. Helped crack a million dollar black market operation in France. Now living here in Chicago, auditor for the Internal Revenue Bureau, grade seven. Son's made to order. He is. I got to know him well during the war. I was the CO. We've kept in touch since. You think he'll go for this deal? Well, he's ambitious. Wants to get out on his own. Can fly pretty high on $60,000. I wouldn't know. <laughs> this was the man Winters wanted for the job. His name was Barry Amsterdam. Barry had been introduced to us, we quickly briefed him on what we wanted him to do. Unicorns is syndicate front, a financial clearinghouse, but we've got to prove it, and that's where you come in. Kern was an accountant, a tax expert. Break it all down, and it still adds up to a high-priced bookkeeper, right? I should only be such a bookkeeper. Kern operated first class. Brooks Brothers suits, dollar cigars. It's the way I'd like to operate when I get out on my own, but on the level of tenant. Play along with us, and you will. Kern said he had enough evidence to put Valid on ice for the next hundred years. Now, what kind of evidence could a bookkeeper get his hands on? Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You want me to find out what Kern found out? Is that it? That's it. I've already taken the liberty of speaking to your commissioner. He'll cooperate if you're willing. Well, it's very nice to have met you, gentlemen. Pat, I'll get out the next corner. You were born for the job, Barry. I was born to die in bed at the age of 90. Winter said you were a bright boy. I'm bright enough to be a coward where the syndicate is concerned. I'm not cut out for this cloak and dagger stuff. We think you are. Give me one good reason why I should stick my neck out. We can give you 60,000 good reasons. What? $60,000, Mr. Amsterdam, if you pull this job off. You wanted to set up your own accounting and business management firm, didn't you? Yes, yes, of course I did, but I wanted to do it while I was alive. Look, Mr. Amsterdam. You're going to get 60 grand for doing what the guys on the force do every day. And you know how long it takes them to make 60 grand? 12 years. All right. You shame me into it, Lieutenant. You and the 60,000. One at a time, one at a time. You better be in love with one at a time. Take my advice, you're gonna find you're better off in loving one at a time. Hiya, what's up? Men from 20 to 83 don't go in for variety. When you start loving two or more, trouble comes a knocking at the door. One at a time, one at a time, you better be in love with. One at a time Tell all the gals That you decline To be in love with more than one at a time oh, oh. Old King Solomon thought he could Have a lot more than one man should But when he felt the end was near This is what he shouted for all to hear One at a time one at a time, you better be in love with one at a time. Take my advice, you're gonna find you better off in love in one at a time. You better be in love with 
one at a time. Tell all the girls that you decline to be in love with more than one at a time. One at a time, one at a time. You better be in love with one at a time. Tell all the girls that you decline. You better be in love with one at a time. Well, Stinger. I feel lucky again. So be sensible, will you? Been in there twice now, and each time you've taken a bath. Isn't that enough? Well, I happen to enjoy it. Do you mind? You know, I've been trying to determine whether you're more fascinated by gambling than by gamblers. After all, the way you played up with them and everything. Really, for a new day, don't you think you're taking too much for granted? I don't trust that kind. They just as soon cut your throat as look at you. Look, why don't we compromise, Tony? You go home, and I'll take a cab later. Over my dead body. How would I know the difference? Okay, Sue. It's your throat. See you around, honey. Oh, Tony. The card, please. You must have been born in Las Vegas. So why don't you try Moe's system? Mo always wins. He says you can't lose if you just bet on winning numbers. Of course, if you insist on betting on losing numbers... What's the big idea? Mo always wins. Oh, it's just that I wouldn't want to see you take another bath. On the other hand, it might be a very pleasant sight. Next time, ask your friend Mo to tell you how to get in here without using me for a front. Well, where would I find a more attractive front? I suppose Mo told you a better system. Mm-hmm. He said to watch you and do exactly the opposite. Raise your bets, folks. Well, like they say, every man to his own poison. What's yours? Red. Even. Black. Odd. Twenty-five. Red. Odd. Haven't you had enough? I'll have to have this old kid this morning. All right. I'll be at the bar. Thank you. You're not serious about going back there for more punishment, are you? Why not? The night's young. Compared to you, it's ancient. Whatever that means. Honey, when it comes to gambling, you belong in Dakers. When it comes to gambling. I've just had a streak of bad luck. It'll change. Sure, sure it will. Just as soon as you go out that door. The gent may have a point there, Miss Morton. Excuse me, Mr. Gilbert. Certainly, Brad. I'm Brad Lacey. Yes, I know. I'm happy to meet you, Mr. Lacey. About this check, Miss Morton, I'd like to help you out, but we have a strict policy about cashing personal checks. Afraid it might bounce? Wouldn't be the first time it's happened. Not that I think this one will. Like I said, it's just a matter of policy. Mr. Lacey. You, uh, seen Mel Burke around? He hasn't been around in some time. That's what I figured. Since about, uh, Tuesday, huh? If you happen to see him, uh, tell him someone saw him make the hit. He might be interested. Well, look at 
the horses you play, you put up two, you get back two and a half. What good is that? So I put up two grand, I get 2,500. Oh, oh, gee, I'm sorry, buddy. We are just talking about How's the horses. Sure? I know that, yeah, it's all right, thanks. It's a lot of weapon for only a dime. Mr. Barry Amsterdam. Smelling salts, huh? Didn't I just see you at the Tropicana shaking your maracas? My fan club. I told you I have talent. Still hurt? Only when I laugh. Need an MC, Connie? Dance? Sing? I don't know about his dancing, but I got a hunch he can sing like a mink. You like that music, Mr. Amsterdam? Old stuff, isn't it? Everything gets better with age except women. They don't write songs like that anymore. Of course, they used to play it faster, but then everything was faster those days. 20, 25 years ago, huh? I imagine you were a lot faster yourself. Yeah, philosopher. College man. Must be Phi Beta Whatchamacallit. Copper. Copper or copper. Are you ready, Clipping? Yes. What do you carry it with you for, to impress the girls? I don't as a rule, but I thought you boys might enjoy it more than they would a comic book. Yeah, I figured we'd frisk you, huh? How else was I going to get in to see you? You took money under the table, huh? Guess the table wasn't low enough. You must be a lousy tax man if they found it out. They found it out because Landell got drunk one night and shot off his mouth. For your scrapbook. Thanks. I read about that a few days ago. One of the other papers gave you a much bigger spread. Well, like the man said, I don't care what you say about me, just so you spell my name right. The man was wrong. In some business, it's better if no one sees your name. You know who I am? Well, of course I do. You're Arnie Vallon. I've seen your picture in the paper a couple of times. You see what I mean? Publicity is good for actors and politicians only. You know why you're here? I guess. You tell me. I saw Mel Burke make the hit. The hit? College man. Don't talk to me as if I was some gangster or something. I understand good English. All right. I saw Burke kill Kern. You just happened to be there at the time, huh? I was coming out of the federal building. The bureau had given me my walking papers, so I was walking. How'd you know Burke? I didn't. Never saw him before in my life. How'd you know it was him? Well, I got a pretty good look at him, and I had an idea I could find out who he was. You said you could have a drink. Excuse me. Go ahead, but ask first. Well, like I said, I thought I had an idea how I could find out who it was. I went to the cops. I told them that somebody had stolen my hubcaps and I thought I could recognize the thief. They let me look through the mug shots and I picked out Burke's picture. You told them that Burke stole your hubcaps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cops laughed even harder. They said Burke was one of your boys and that he didn't have to go around lifting hubcaps. Well, I told him I guess maybe I'd made a boo-boo, and, well, that's how I found out who shot Kern. Why didn't you tell the police, Mr. Amsterdam? Barry to my friends. Why didn't you tell the police, Mr. Amsterdam? Ouch. Well, supposing I had. So what? I get a pat on the back for outstanding service to the community, and a couple of days later, I get a bullet hole in the same place. You want to pay off for keeping your mouth shut, is that it? I'll let you tell me what it's worth to you. I'll tell you what it's worth. Nothing. So you go to the police. So they pick up Burke. So he doesn't talk. So I know nothing about it. 
Why am I here, then? Oh, that's a good question. You a lawyer, too? Mm, commercial law, business management, stuff like that. Business management, huh? That's a good background. Shame to waste it on the tax department. I'll tell you why you're here, Mr. Amsterdam. Because I don't like trouble. If you go to the police and tell them that Burke killed Kern, immediately the papers say that Arnie Vallant is behind it. Do they know? They know nothing. I say I don't know anything about it. Kern was my friend. But I'm supposed to be a big man in the syndicate. <laughs> syndicate. A fancy word they made up. I don't even know what they mean. But like I say, I don't like trouble. That's why you're here. I'd wanted to cause you trouble, Mr. Vallon. I'd have done it by now. You want a job? Strictly legitimate. I don't touch anything else. One hundred dollars a week. Is there a future in it for me? There's either a good future for you, Mr. Amsterdam, or there's no future at all. Go down to the Unicorn Casualty and Life Insurance Company tomorrow morning and ask for Jack Roper. Take him home. Mr. Vallant told me to come in and see you. See Ben Lewis. He's head of accounting. He'll show you what to do. Thank you. Get me Mr. Ballant. What do you think of the little enchilada I ran into? Maybe she'll be good for the Ralph Banning Frisco. What do you think of it, Connie? Can't she sing? Oh, with a chest like that, you ought to sing bass. You saw enough. Get her. Mr. Roper calling. Adios, boy. Bye. Yes, Jack? Amsterdam just came in. I turned him over to Lewis in the accounting department. Good. Keep your eye on him. Let me know everything he does. If he works out, I have some plans for him. Okay, Arnie, I'll keep you posted. Good. Will you stop filing your nails at the table? Where were you brought up, anyway? Sometimes wonder why I put up with you. Want me to tell you? I don't get funny. You lay off the goggle so early in the morning. Barry was smart enough not to rush things. He wanted to wait until they accepted him as a permanent fixture, knowing all the time that they were watching every move he made. Not only in the office, but even when he tried to get lost in the heavy shopping crowds of the loop, Barry knew there was always someone tailing him. To see where he was going, who his friends were, or whether he would make a contact. Barry knew it was going to be tough to shake that shadow, or at least be one jump ahead of it, so that he could keep a date he had made in the Northern Indian and Eskimo wing of the Chicago Museum of Natural History. you told Ben Lewis about settling that Cleo Allen claim? Seventy-five grand is a lot of dough to be handing out, especially if we can duck it. She lost a diamond and uh, emerald necklace. What's wrong with it? Nothing wrong, but I can beat it. Legitimately, I mean. Everything's strictly on the up and up. I can't take that chance. 
All she has to do is drag us into court. She won't. Don't worry. You seem pretty sure of yourself. Well, I wouldn't be wasting your time if I wasn't. What have we got to lose? If it doesn't pan out, you write the lady a check and that's that. It's just not healthy, that's all. You start messing around with business ethics... Look, I'm not selling anything. I'm just trying to save you 70,000 bucks. 70,000? What happened to the other five? Well, you see, I'm, uh, I'm not eligible for the regular Christmas bonus. I thought maybe I could earn one. Ethically? Smelling like a rose. Let me think about it. Tell you how he's going to pull it off? No, but he wants five grand for himself if he does. That's what I like about him, Jack. He's hungry for money. That could be good for us. Shall I let him go ahead? Yeah, let's see how he does it. You hit the jackpot. Fix it. Well, that's the nicest necklace I never owned. Oh, Lieutenant Fenton gave me a message for you. Valent went to the fights with Roper. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Hi, Mr. Roper. Hi, Barry. Valent? Oh, where are you sitting? Oh, I'm back up there with the peasants. We'll swap with them. You'll see better there. Thanks. You remember Connie. Never pass a brandy bottle that I don't think of her. Mr. Chico, Mr. Amsterdam. Hi, Miss Chico. Oh. He comes to all the fights, but he hates him. I'll never take the place of higher life. What happened to that claim you're going to fix up, Barry? Just a lot of talk, huh? There you are. All signed, sealed, and delivered. She was drawing the claim? Read it. Hit him with a left, stupid. Hit him. Like Barry made a gift of seventy-five thousand dollars to the stockholders. Seventy thousand. Mr. Roper promised me five if I delivered. <laughs> that claim looked pretty solid to me. How did you manage it? Well, in checking the claim, I noticed that while the policy was made out to Cleo Allen, someone else was making the payments on the premiums. Guess who? Henry Nugent. It's old Holy Joe himself. He's married and got three kids. That's what came to my mind. I figured that if Nugent were making the payments on the insurance, he must also have bought the necklace. Blackmail is a touchy proposition, Barry. Oh, Mr. Roper, I wouldn't stoop that low. I simply told Mr. Nugent that the company might have to contest the claim. In that event, it'd be witnesses and uh, evidence subpoenas. Well, the next thing I knew, the old boy was telling me to pick up a letter to the theater, and that's all it was to it. You earned the five grand, Barry. Oh, thanks, Mr. Valent. But I'm still looking for that future you promised me. Don't blame you. I'd like to get my fingers on some of that real long green regular life. I've been poor and I've been rich. Take it from me, rich is better. Come on. I've seen enough of this. You'll be hearing from me. Well, don't you want to stay and see who wins? Are you kidding? Valent wanted to test Barry. So he gave him the set of books Kern kept for government examiners only. If Barry blew the whistle on him, Valent knew he was protected because these were not his personal books. But Barry knew it was a dry run. Valent had messed him up just enough to have Barry holler to the authorities. He knew that somewhere there was another set of books, Valent's own. Check those books were in. I can't believe that Kern kept them. Why not? There's some holes in there big enough to drive Leavenworth through. I could get killed with books like that. Well, maybe that's what he wanted. I thought you said he was your friend. That's what I thought. Well, they're all right now. You can take them to the Internal Revenue and get a clean bill of health. Mind if I have a drink? You don't have to ask. Yeah. Like a
like I said. What do you want? Just like to ask you a few questions. How'd you get in here? Ah, uh, no, oh, police. We heard you saw who bumped Kern. Oh, did you now? Now, where'd you hear that? Things get around. What do you think? Don is got a tab on what we're doing, and we don't have a tab on what he's doing? That kind of dirt travels fast on a two-way street. Why don't you take me down to headquarters? We take you down there, and you say you saw nothing. That ends it. We can't question you there like we can't hear. Oh, I see. Well, your questions might be different down there, but my answers would be the same. You boys better get a refund. You bought the wrong dirt. Good night, fellas. I'm going to bed. Uh, you don't listen good, do you? I missed something? We said the reason that we're not dragging you in is because uh, we can question you better here. <laughs> I don't see the difference. You get the difference now? You saw a melt back trigger current, didn't you? I don't even here to take care of you now. So get! Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, fellas. Don't. Smart. Yeah, don't. Don't hit me. Anymore. I'll tell you everything you want. It's all right, Hugo. What's the trouble, Barry? I just wanted to tell you this. You can take your books and your job and everything else you got, and you know what you can do with it. What's eating you? If you don't trust me, you don't want me, and I don't want you. How do you know? No cops could afford suits like they wore. Besides that, to be a cop, you gotta have some education. Those two goons talk like they've been left back six times in the fourth grade. Now, don't be hard on me, Barry. You know by now I can't be too careful. Did I ever do anything to make you run a test on me? Now, nah, forget it. Let's just say I goofed. Remember when I gave you that job at Unicorn, I told you there'd either be a good future for you or no future at all. Well, which is it? Good. I'm going to give you a chance to make some of that big money you've been itching for. I need somebody to make some spot checks for me. Make sure some of the boys have been holding out since Kern died. Well, it shouldn't be too hard to do. What's in it for me? Ten percent of everything they've been holding out on me. You feel better now? Yeah, sure. That long green can cure most everything. <laughs> Come on, make yourself a drink. From Chicago, nerve center of the operation, Barry now learned how the syndicate worked. It was like a giant octopus whose tentacles spread from Chicago into practically every state in the Union. The syndicate took in from 10 to 15 million a year from gambling alone. Another 20 million from shakedowns and all the other rackets. This money was turned over to underlings who operated bars, nightclubs, all sorts of joints by the hundreds. The syndicate also controlled, for example, ice companies. And who used ice? Bars and nightclubs. So for a lot of ice cubes that were never delivered, the bars paid the ice companies a fortune. Valent would hold the ice companies a few years and then sell to the Unicorn Casualty Insurance Company. Through Unicorn, the money flowed out to finance other businesses, some phony, some legitimate. Trucking, distilleries, the Sapphire Hotel in Miami, and dozens of other enterprises. It was one pocket to another, multiplied a hundred times. Big profits, small taxes. Since it all became capital gains and the syndicate stayed clean. When he got through checking, he told Valent in what spots he was being taken and by whom. You know Ben Hammond? How are you? Uh, Delaware, a Mohawk loan and mortgage, right? That's right. Sit low. Uh, Detroit, Larson's used cars. That's it. Henderson. Oh, Henderson's easy. I came from there. St. Louis, Apex Ice. No mistake. Miller. 
Miller is uh, Miami Peacock Room. I had a good time there. I saw you. <laughs> what a memory for names, huh? And for figures. He scared me more than the tax boys. <laughs> Where'd you find him? I didn't. He found me. What is there I don't like about him? Probably Arnie. I never figured a pair of pants would push me out of the picture. Oh, a man gets to a certain age. He's more interested in brains than dames. Arnie ain't that old. Sweetness, would you please? Well, if it isn't the lady gambler. What are you doing here, slumming? I wasn't until now. No flattery will get you nowhere. And who fronted for you so you could crash in here? No, no one. I've been spoiled by you. What do you say? Let's be friends. Let's not be anything. Now, not that it'll break your heart, but I have to leave. See your old friend? I told you before. I don't even know his name. You will. See where he went? Inner sanctum? For big wheels only. <laughs> I'm not that big, Sue. I just take orders. They give them. Did you say his name was? I didn't. But it's Amsterdam. Barry Amsterdam. Valence number one man. She a big wheel, too? Valance personal property. He likes young stuff. I told you to get out and stay out. I think she just aged 10 years. I'm going to make this short and sweet. After Curran wasn't around anymore, some of the boys thought they'd fatten up at my expense. Smart. Didn't think I'd find out about it. So some of the money that was supposed to come through didn't. They weren't satisfied with their cut. They wanted part of mine. Well, what's part of mine is part of yours. But they forgot one thing. That sooner or later, I'd dig up somebody as smart as Kern. Maybe smarter. Barry. So those that got a little extra green on their fingers got a warning. The others are out. For good. Now, I want you to pass the word down the line that if there's any more holdouts, there'll be no more warnings. No more talk. No more nothing. They're finished. Now, go out and have some fun. Go to the bar and get a drink. Truce pack? What'd you do, spike it with hemlock? <laughs> You're a trusting soul, aren't you? Well, I must say, our relations haven't exactly been cordial. Well, I'm trying to remedy it. What else can I do? You know, that's a leading question, and I hope it's leading to where I think it is. To uh, better relations between us? Would you do me a favor? Oh, I know there was a catch to this truce pack business. Well, I hope it's not that bad. I just wanted you to take me home. You wanted me to? Well, uh, what would Lacey say? What could he say? He takes orders. You give them. Friend of yours, Barry? Oh, yes. Uh, Miss Morton, Mr. Vallant. How do you do? We met some time ago when we both carved our initials in the leg of a roulette table. You have good taste, Barry. Thank you. You have good taste, Barry. Same line he handed me when Chico first brought me around. You're drunk. What have I got to be sober about? You'd better go home. Chico. Want to get rid of me, huh? Got your eye on this new hunk of merchandise that Bright Boy brought around. It's good with the figures, all right. In more ways than one. Shut up. Come, Connie, I'll take you home. Nobody's taking me home. I want to stay, I'll stay. Nobody pushes Connie around, because I can do some pushing myself. Now get her out of here. Come, Connie, let's go home. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Miss Morgan. Okay, so we see they're putting an accountant undercover 
to get himself infiltrated into the mob and do a little forensic accounting into the mob's finances. You know, that's the same way that they caught Al Capone. He, they never got Al Capone for murder or bootlegging. They got him for tax evasion. And this film, tonight's film, is also set in Chicago. So I think we all see the obvious inspiration for the story of the picture. And uh, we also have an uh, interesting note here. Uh, the scenes where the mob is following Barry downtown in Chicago, and there's a, a part where the voiceover mentions the heavy shopping crowds of the Loop. Now, for those of you who have never been to Chicago, uh, the Loop is an area of downtown Chicago that today, in a more modern era, in a more modern era, that is the scene downtown of the heart of nightlife in Chicago. If you're willing to drop some serious dough spending coin, you know, the finest restaurants, the best bars, nightclubs, venues, you know, for a night of entertainment, that's where it is in Chicago, downtown in a section that's called The Loop. Now, uh, Abby Lane, Abby Lane, who uh, is playing the role of Connie tonight, get this, in real life, she was married to Xavier Cougat, who's playing the role of Benny. Uh, he's the, the Latin band leader at the club. They were married in real life. And when at the time they were married, she was only half his age. And I just can't believe you. Know, how does a guy like that, in real life, married to her, how does he get some beautiful dame like that that's half his age? <laughs> that lucky dog. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> now, Abby, um, she had, you know, obviously an established career before tonight's film. She was not just an actress, uh, she was also a singer and dancer, uh, played in many venues nationwide, and she had quite a reputation for wearing very risque outfits, uh, a, a, a very seductive sex pot way of performing on stage. Uh, I guess the way to say it, she was essentially the share of her day. Uh, and I think that's probably why we see these scenes where they kind of showcase her and her talent in those scenes where she's singing at the nightclub uh, there with Benny's orchestra. Well, Let's go ahead and get back to Chicago Syndicate. You don't have to go to all this trouble, Sue. I'm really a pushover. That's one out of left field. Thanks. Oh, wow. You see it go by? What? My hat. <laughs> Like a chaser? Oh, well, thanks. The way you're mixing these, I'd probably need a chaser for the chaser. What are you after? What makes you think I'm after something? You've got more switches in the railroad yard. First you give me the price, now you're romancing me like I was Liberace. Woman's prerogative to change her mind. It's a man's prerogative to find out why she changed it. Well, I just decided I'd rather have you as a friend than an enemy. All right, so we're friends. Just what are you trying to prove, friend? Soft lights, stiff drinks, loaded conversation? What have I got that you want? Maybe I'm just fascinated by men who live in shadows. Oh, brother, shadows yet. Well, you don't have to make fun of me, just because I'm hospitable. 
Does this hospitable business include Arnie Vallon as well? How did Vallon get in here? Well, he hasn't yet, but I have a feeling he will if you have your way. Look, let's stop this footsie business. You don't like Fallon. He's not your type. Aren't you presuming a lot? You almost up Chuck tonight when he pushed Connie around, yet you're pretending it was all right. Why? Why are you climbing? Climbing? From Lacey to Amsterdam to Vallant. A triple play, is that what you had in mind? You make it sound as though I were Mata Harry. You know what happened to her? She caught her death of cold standing in front of a firing squad. Oh, I'm sorry, that was clumsy of me. Here, I'll pick up the piece. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's all right, it's all right, I'll live. Just get me a Band-Aid or something, I'll be as good as new. What you were looking for, Mr. Amsterdam? As I think so. The, um, the JK on the luggage. Now, what could that J stand for? Jean? Janet? Jenny? No. Now, Jenny doesn't seem to suit you. It'd be more like, uh, Joyce? And the K. I wonder if by any possible chance that could stand for Kern. Joyce Kern? Now that you've found what you're looking for, suppose you tell me what I'm looking for. All I know is what I read in the papers. May I? Mr. Amsterdam, you said something before. Let's stop playing footsie. My father's been killed. My mother's dead because of it. Well, my hair's down now, and my hate is showing. So before this gun goes off, perhaps you'll tell me who killed my father. What well, makes you think I know? You're Valance number one man, remember? You give orders. Others take them. Supposing I told you to uh, put that thing away. There, you see? People don't always do what they're told. You little idiot. What do you think you're doing? Playing games? Fallon finds out who you are, he'll strip the skin off your lily white back. Well, you're his number one boy, aren't you? What are you waiting for? I should, I should at that, but then the neighbors might complain about the noise and I'd have to spend the night in jail. Besides that, I prefer your skin where it is on your back. You see, I had a weak spot for a gal named Sue Morton. Now, let me give you a little A1 advice. You get out of this town and stay out. Don't ever let me see you around here again. Next time, I won't care if the neighbors do complain. Uh, 407, please. Second door to your right. Thank you. Why didn't you tell me that Kern's daughter was playing Sue Morton, girl detective? Nobody knew until she went to see Haynes after you found her out. She'd taken a tramp steamer home from Europe without telling anyone. Oh, the little dope could have wound up in the bottom of some river. Did Haynes tell her about me? Felt he had to. Thought it'd make her feel better to know someone was trying to get Valen. Well, I just hope he told her to keep off my neck. How are things going after them? Oh, fine, fine. Getting rich fast. We're paying you 60 grand to get Valen, not to get rich off you. Yes, I know, I know. And a weaker man would be tempted, believe me. I never saw so much cash floating around. What about his personal books? Oh, sits on them like a hen on eggs. Nobody gets to look at those. Unless maybe it's this girl, Connie. She seems to have something on him. I thought he trusted you. <laughs> Where his own books are concerned, he doesn't even trust his mother. He's got one, too. But he's been hinting lately. Hinting at what? Well, evidently, his own personal bookkeeping was all loused up when Kern died. He's been talking about setting up some kind of a business partnership with me. Probably wants me to keep an eagle eye on his own funds. 
Can't we get Valen through some of those phony companies he set up? No, 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 he's too smart for that. None of those companies are registered in his name. They're all held in the name of some flunky of his, a front man who cuts it up with Arnie. You clamp one and you get the front man, but not Arnie. No, no, you can't touch him that way. Well, and the only solution is to get a look at Valen's own books. Well, that's only half of it. The other half is going to be much tougher. Getting them out of his hands to use as evidence. You're getting the 60 grand, you figure it out. I came to tell you how sorry I am. I had no idea that... Wait a minute. Come on in. Haynes was a fool to tell you. No, he wasn't. It made me feel better to know that... that there's some people trying to do something about this. After my father was killed, I... I heard nothing more. I was desperate. I know. But it's better this way, believe me. You'd have only gummed things up. Besides, that's much too pretty an act to stick out. If I can ever do anything to help... Just stay out of the way. And whatever you do, keep using that Sue Morton moniker. All right, Barry. Good luck. Sue. <laughs> Joyce. I'm going to ask you something. It's not going to be very pleasant for you, but... Well, you were your father's only legatee. He left everything he had to you. Since you've been back, have you come across anything that you think I should know about? No. Not that I know of. But then I didn't know much about his affairs, having spent the last few years in Europe. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Would you get a hold of every paper, bill, letter, receipt, anything at all that belonged to your father and bring them here to me? I'd like to look at them. You can't tell. It might be just... Excuse me. Hello? Barry? Arnie? Why don't you take a little ride with me? I want to show you something. I want to show you some figures. Some very special figures you haven't seen before. Yeah, I'll pick you up in ten minutes. Well, fine, fine. I'll, uh, I'll meet you downstairs. I'll be waiting. Right. Valent. Yes. I'm finally going to get a look at these personal books, the ones your father kept for him. This is the evidence that I've been waiting for. Got to let Fenton know, but I don't know where Valen's taking me. Did you come in a cab or did you drive? I drove. My car's downstairs. All right, I'm going to give you a chance to play girl detective, only this time for blood. Taking you? I'll find out soon enough, I guess. You're gonna meet my old lady. You'll like her. She still worries about me, like the friends I keep. <laughs> like I was still a kid. Yeah, they're all the same. But to them, you never grow up. Yeah. You know that partnership I talked to you about? I've decided to go through with it. You'll check on everything the way Kern did. That's why I want you to see my system of bookkeeping. Now, this partnership, how's it gonna work? I'll cut you in on everything from my end. Thanks, honey. You burned it. One other thing. Uh, these books will be mine. They'll be in your name. Well, if anything goes wrong and they're found, then you'll take the rap. You'll be in the clear. Right. Uh, is this the way you worked it with Kern? No, I made a mistake with Kern. Those books were in my name. But this way, if anybody wants to blow the whistle, Blow it on you, not me. neighborhood years ago. I wanted her to have a fancy apartment over in Lakeshore Drive. She wouldn't have any part of it. She's lived here ever since she was married. So her kids born here, the old man died. 
All the friends are here. Market, church. We can be at home anyplace else. Just so she's happy, that's all that counts. That's the way I figure it. Wait to see the apartment. Hasn't changed since I was a kid. Yeah, get yourself some candy. Come on, split it. Come on. See that corner? I call it Death Corner. I used to hang out there when I was a young punk, itching to make something of myself. More killings there with shivs and guns in the 20s and 30s than any spot in this town. That's where I first saw the big boys, Capone, O'Banion, Big Jim, Colosimo. I'm the last of the old mob, Barry. Only because I learned from the boners they made. I'm a long way, huh? That's the window to my old lady's apartment. When I was a kid, I used to yell up, Hey, Ma, throw me down two cents. <laughs> Big deal. Buy jawbreakers and tootsie rolls. Hey, Ma! Yeah, Louie! Throw me down a dime, will ya? It's got him. Uh. Inflation. Detective Lieutenant Fenton, please. Oh, Arnie! Hi. How are you feeling, oh, Mama? I'm fine, Arnie, fine. Come in, Why don't you come meet in. a friend of mine, Barry Amsterdam? Oh, I'm always happy to meet a friend of Arnie's. How do you do, Mrs. Allen? Well, I haven't seen you for a long time. Why did you let me know you were coming and it made something special for you? Well, I can't stay very long, Mama. I uh, just wanted to see how you were and pick up that book I left here. Oh, well, you go ahead. I'll make some coffee. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, now, son, take off your coat and make yourself oh, at home. <laughs> What's he doing at Maxwell and Fiore? His mother still lives there. I didn't know he had one. Talk to your lady when you look this over. Arnie, this is so simple a kid could follow it. That's why I want you to keep the same system so I can make heads or tails of it. Complicated bookkeeping throws me. Oh, Arnie tells me you're a college graduate. Oh. I wanted Arnie to go to college, too. How we could have afforded it, I don't know. But we would have managed somehow. But Arnie didn't want it. Suppose I had gone to college, Mom. I might have become an accountant like Barry here. <laughs> this way I can afford to pay an accountant to work for me. Oh, your son does pretty good, Mrs. Valley. <laughs> I know. Can I show you something, Mr. Amsterdam? Go, oh, come on, I'll sure. show you. Come on. This is Arnie when he was confirmed. Would you believe it? No, I wouldn't. And this is Arnie when he graduated from public school. There, that one. Oh, it's not hard to pick him out, is it? Oh, I've heard some bad stories about Arnie, but I don't believe him. I know my son, and I know he wouldn't do anything bad, really bad.
see if Arnie's letting that coffee get burnt. You go to him now. Come in. Arnie? Yeah, bye. Arnie, what'd you do with the... Well, now that you know how I want ours kept... Why don't you go into the living room? I'll have coffee ready for you in a minute. Okay. Oh, go on, son. Join Arnie. Who can that be? I wasn't expecting anyone. Probably late. <laughs> I'll get it. Just a minute! He burned it. He burned it. Let go, Stanton. You know him? All my life. He's a detective, a lieutenant detective. Detective? Oh, I thought he was a hood. Just goes to show you, you can't tell the difference. When he tried to push past me, I thought he was going for you. What's the matter? What's oh, happened? It's nothing, Ma. It's all right. You go inside. I want to talk to these boys out here. What's your name? Amsterdam, very Amsterdam. Yeah, I heard. Crooked tax boy made good in a bad Take way. Take it easy, Fenton. What do you expect when you come busting in here? Yeah, did you say you were a cop? Did you show a search warrant? Let go of me. It's all right, boys. What am I supposed to do? Let everyone who wants push up to Arnie? What do you want, Fenton? I, uh, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about Mel Burke. Well, what about him? We found the gun used on Kern. The bullets matched, and we traced it to Burke. We thought you might know where he was. What'd you have to come up here for and scare the life out of his old lady? You know where he lives. Why didn't you go there? We did, and he wasn't home, so we put out a call, and his car was spotted downstairs. You passed the question, Valent. I said, where's Burke? I haven't seen him in more than a year. Maybe you'd like to tell us. Maybe you'd like to buy one of our life insurance policies. You might get killed going down those stairs. All right, we'll find him. And when we do, we're going to have a couple more questions to ask you, Valent. Any time at all, Fenn, except announce yourself next time, huh? You pull another trick like this, and I'll break your head wide open. Come on, fellas. I've been wanting to do that all my life. I've had the guts. On the very same night Joyce came to see Barry with all the data she could find that belonged to her father, Barry knew that the police had picked up Burke in Florida and had started extradition proceedings. The papers Joyce brought were meaningless, until Barry came to one in particular, a receipt made out to Nelson Kern from the Melrose Microfilm Company. $18.60 for microfilming. What was that for? I wondered about that one myself. But I thought many accounting firms might use microfilm to record papers. Yes, that's true. There's a lot of business reasons. Except that this was made out to your father personally, not the firm of Kern Associates. And it was paid for with cash. Why? The next morning, Joyce went down to the Melrose Microfilm Company. I have a receipt here made out to Mr. Kern for some microfilming. Was it ever picked up? Well, now, let's see. K, 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 A, K, E, Kern. Here it is. Oh, uh, well, this was picked up quite some time ago. Did Mr. Kern pick it up himself? No, uh... No, it was a young lady. Uh, she said she was Mr. Kern's secretary. <laughs> the reason I remember, um, well, she was also very attractive. Would well, you remember what it was that Mr. Kern had microfilmed? Well, yes, it uh, was a ledger on several hundred pages for which we charged two cents a page. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Becker, Nelson Kern's secretary, had quickly been summoned to Lieutenant Detective Fenton's office for questioning based on the information Joyce Kern uncovered. Miss Becker knew nothing about any microfilm. But Fenton now knew why Kern was killed. And he could almost put his finger on the person who picked up the microfilm. To make certain, he sent Joyce back there with a photo. The clerk at Melrose Microfilm was quick to recognize a photo of Connie as the girl who called for the envelope addressed to Mr. Kern. That night, I sneaked up to Barry's apartment with Joyce Kern. The knowledge that Connie had picked up the microfilm spelled a dead end for Barry. Feeling that he had nothing else to go on, he wanted to call it quits. All right, so we know who picked it up. What good does that do? If we could only find it, we could prove that he's the head. You think that Valent is stupid enough to hang on to that? That microfilm could cause an exposure bigger than the H-bomb. Take it from me, it's nothing but ashes now. It's no use, Dave. We're, we're bush leaguers compared to them. 
Isn't there something else we can do? Well, you tell me. Everywhere I turn, I hit a stone wall. All right, so I am finally a partner of sort. He even keeps Valance books. But they're in my name. If anybody finds them, he stays in the clear and I end up a crook. What do you want me to do? Put the finger on myself? Wait for the brakes. What brakes? The way Valance plays it, he's got things plugged so tight there are no brakes. I'm serious, Dave. Forget it. I know when I'm licked. Who is it? Hey. Just a minute. Ah, what brings you here? Well, they sent me over. He tried to get you earlier. No dice. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I was out for a while. What does he want? He decided to throw a little party to celebrate that new partnership that you and Egypt with. Who's in there? No one. Thought I heard some talking on the way. I said no one. Why didn't you tell me? Don't I have any private life of my own anymore? Now I know why you didn't even answer the phone. I'll tell Arnie. Meet us at the Tropicana. You know, it's funny. Arnie told me to ask you to bring that trick along. He goes for it. Let's see. Thanks, Joyce. For a minute there, I thought... This could be the break we wanted, Barry. You said that you thought Connie had something on him. You mean use Joyce to make Connie mad enough to talk, is that it? It's our only chance. I heard him say Valance attracted to her. Not exactly those words. How about it, Joyce? You willing to be used to do a little green-eyed needling? What do you want me to do? Remember Miss Morton, Arnie? Of course. Couldn't forget her. Glad you could come. I'm so happy to see you again, Mr. You know everyone. I believe so. Pardon me. I didn't mean to sit so close. Yeah, couldn't be close enough. Oh, brother. Where'd you up there, Chico? Long ago, I found out they do very well without this stick. But this stick without them? Nothing. Mary. Excuse me, boys. It's one. What are you drinking, Barry? Oh, I'm drinking stingers. I'll have another one. Ginger ale. Nate uh, told me about... Uh... Oh, he did. It's got a pretty big mouth. One of these days, I'm going to put my fist in it. That's what I like about you, Barry. You're a gentleman. You never talk. I admire that. You didn't bring me up here just to tell me what a gentleman I am, did you, honey? No. It's a touchy subject, this partnership. I was wondering if we could spread it a little to have you cut me in on something of yours. about Connie. Do you like her? She does nothing to me. Me neither. Why is it time, though? You see, Miss Morton may not be a lady, but she acts like one. Connie isn't a lady and doesn't act like one. Connie's a bomb. A thing like this could cause her to explode. She knows a lot of me. Don't you let me worry about that. All right. You can wrap it up and take it off. Thanks. This time, why don't you just try climbing into his lap? I would, but you're already there. And I'm staying there. You might as well understand that. Say, uh, how does she feel about me, personally, I mean? You'll have no trouble making the grade. Good. And Arnie's always telling me Barry's girl is such a lady. 
Lady My Foot. Well, by comparison. Oh! Sugar and cream? Why, you. Knock it off, knock it off. But I saw you had it coming. Come on, Connie. Chase for you. No, no. Quick. Andre, bring this up. Come on, sit down. Join the left nomads. Where did Arnie go? Quick switch, honey. Well, I'm really not such a bad guy until after you get to know me better. What kind of a man are you, letting him walk off with your girl? What kind of a woman are you, letting her walk off with your man? I wasn't here to stop her. Oh, cut it out, honey. He's finished with you. Through, done with. Kaput, and there's nothing you or I can do about it. Well, maybe there's nothing you can do about it, but there's plenty I can do. Give me a for instance. I'll save it for Arnie. Don't worry, bright boy. You'll soon have her right back in your hair. Like dandruff. Want me to stick around and drive you home? Thanks, but Chico knows where I live. Good old puppy dog Chico. Still hanging around with his tail wagon. For a week, Connie tried to get in touch with Fallon. Every time she called, Barry was on the other end. You're wasting a fortune in dimes, Connie. No. No, he's always soup. Well, how would I know when he's coming back? It doesn't matter anyhow. He's not home to you. Look, do me a favor, will you, honey? Don't call anymore. Who was that? The ex-girlfriend. Can't you smell the tamale burning? She's beginning to be a nuisance. You'd imagine she'd have learned by now. Nobody learns without a lesson first. Why don't you teach her one, Barry? Sort of spell it out for her, easy-like. Well, that's a little out of my department, but... Uh, I'll see what kind of a teacher I could be. Oh, uh, don't miss me too much. Hasta mañana, baby. Good night, Chico. I'm waiting for you, Connie. I've got something to tell you. Save it. Oh, now, don't be like that. I came here to do you a favor. What kind of a favor? Stop hounding Arnie. Forget him. Lay off. Don't phone, don't threaten. Forget he lives. Otherwise... Otherwise? Take it from there, can't you? Why are you telling me this? Call it affinity. As uh, one discard to the other. You know, the cord that binds between castoffs. You not only let him walk off with your girl, but now you're acting as watchdog. How low can you get? Well, if you hang around, you might find out. As far as I'm concerned, you've already hit bottom. That naughty gave me a medal for this. You all right? You okay? Let me alone. Tell Arnie that if he ever tries that again, or I'm ever found dead, the DA's gonna get a letter that'll blow any higher than he just tried to blow me. You didn't want to see me again. And here you practically forced me to come. Miss me, huh? Hello, Arnie. Connie, you ought to know me pretty well. Too by well. Now. Don't interrupt. You ought to know that I don't frighten easily and I don't like to be too. Chico, fix me a drink. Shut up and listen. You can tell the honeymoon's over, can't you? Someday he may even talk to you this way. He may even try to have you knocked off. 
like he did me. Well, you told me to teach her a lesson. I tried talking. She wouldn't listen, so I had a couple of the boys throw a scare in her. Well, I can throw a few scares myself. If you ever try that again... I'll do the talking. Now, what's this about a letter to the D.A.? You know a letter's no good unless you can prove what's in it. Well, according to a lawyer I spoke to, microfilm is, uh, to use his words... Now, what did he say? Mm. Oh, yes, primary evidence. That's what he said, primary evidence. You're lying. Don't test it. You told me you burned it the minute you got out of the store. I lied then, but I'm not lying now. Do you think I don't know what happened to those meaty young kids you played around with before you met me? When you had your fill, you shipped them off, and nobody ever heard a word from them again. Well, I knew this, and I wasn't going to let you bounce me around that way, so I kept the microfilm. Better than life insurance, huh, Arnie? Now you've got to make sure that I live. Otherwise, you don't live either. You're making this up. Like to find out? Get rid of me. Try it. Where is it, Connie? <laughs> don't make me laugh. Where is it, Connie? You'll never get it from me, never. Not even if you kill me, and you won't do that. You can't afford to. Maybe you'll be almost glad I did before I'm through with you. Arnie, don't. And hey, you still carry the torch? Then get her to talk if you want her back in one piece. Honey, tell him. Please tell Stay him. Stay out of this, Chico. Sing it, Chico. Connie won't be able to appear in public for a while. Oh! Ah! 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 don't. Leave it alone. I'll tell, but leave it alone. You'll tell, you know. Well, she gave me something to keep for her. She said that if anything should ever happen to her, to mail it to the district attorney. But I didn't know what it was. So just now, honest, I didn't. Where is it? In my violin case. In the rosin box. In the case I keep at Mark is the music shop. Hold it, boys. The stuff's at some music shop. What's the address? 131 Cleveland Street. Jacob, you didn't. You didn't. Can't you see what you've done? You've killed me. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. You know how I feel about you. I couldn't sit here and listen to you screaming. I was taking it, not you, and if I didn't fall. Oh, you fool, you got this right, little fool. Oh, please, Connie, please, I couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. Take us there. I can't, I can't, I feel sick. Well, go telephone him and tell him we're coming. Hello, Marky. Chico. And Mr. Valent will come down to get my violin case. You know the one, the, the spare one you're holding for me. Give it to him. No, I, I can't come down myself. I'm too busy. Adios. Hugo. You wait until I come back. Hugo will keep you company. Barry. I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm really sick. Some coffee, Hugo, please. I think we could all stand some. Mr. 
That basket. You got a match? Burn it. merchandise from one department store to another. Don't have to buck street traffic. Also to get rid of the trash and that sort of stuff. There's 40 miles of it, but only three openings. Where are they? Cleveland, Halstead, and Ohio. You two go down after them. You take Halstead, and we'll take Ohio.
Call an ambulance. How's it now? Joyce. Oh, my boy. Oh, my boy. Oh, my boy. The information contained on the microfilm was turned over to the various law enforcement agencies, who moved in with a vengeance. Everyone incriminated was picked up, tried, and convicted, and the syndicate was cracked wide open. For how long it will remain so is a matter for constant civic vigilance in our city as well as yours. So, we see that Sue Morton is really Joyce Kern, who is the daughter of the reporter that was murdered in the drive-by, you know, here at the beginning of the picture. So, she was uh, trying to do a little undercover work herself. You know, it was interesting to see in tonight's picture these, uh, th the scenes that had the street vendors uh, in the old poorer neighborhood the street vendors who had their carts and stalls on the sidewalks. You know, you just don't see that much anymore, if at all. And, uh, well, they even mentioned in the movie, you, you know, Valance mom, who still lived in that neighborhood, even though he had the money, you know, to move her out to a nicer place, but she couldn't bring herself to leave because whatever kind of a neighborhood it was, it was where she had lived most of her life, and it was still home. And uh, you, you, you gotta tip a hat to a lady like that who, you know, still has a sentimental attachment to her neighborhood where she had lived most of her life. Now, uh, Allison Hayes, uh, who played Sue Morton slash Joyce Kearns, uh, her career in Hollywood lasted from 54 to from 54 to 67. Um, her work, and she was both in radio, she was in uh, she was in television and in movies. Most of her TV work was guest appearances on various TV series, usually for an episode or two. Um, was never a regular in any of them, but most of her filmography during the same time period, uh, she played in all kinds of genres, but uh, the latter half of her filmography seem to be a lot of horror and science fiction. Uh, in fact, that was where I first saw Allison Hayes. Uh, the first movie that I remembered seeing her in was from 1957, The Undead, where she played the role of Livia. And uh, <laughs> she, she had a lot of health problems at the end of her career in, in Basically, that's what ended her career. She had a lot of health problems, and she ended up suspecting that these were caused from a calcium supplement that she was taking. And so she employed a toxicologist, took him a sample of her medicine, and he found that it had, it did in fact have a an extremely high content of lead in it, and that she was likely suffering from lead poisoning. So, Allison Hayes mounted a campaign uh, approaching the FDA to have this supplement, this calcium supplement, banned from import or sale uh, because of its obvious health effects. 
and it did seem to have an effect. Uh, FDA did a little of their own reset, did their own research, uh, basically confirming what she suspected. And so they made amendments to the laws regarding the importation of, of nutrition supplements. Um, the problem was, uh, she passed away on February 27, 1977. By the time the FDA figured this out, amended the laws, they did send her a, a letter, you know, stating that they had made these changes, but that letter was sent after she had already passed away. So, uh, kind of a sad ending on that note. Now, uh, I gotta ask you though, you know, watching this picture, you, you know, with Benny leading his Caribbean Latin orchestra, you know, I'm watching it and I, and maybe it's because it's from the same era even, but I just could not help but watching him and thinking of Ricky Ricardo from I Love Lucy. <laughs> I mean, the similarities are uncanny. But, uh, well, I thank you for spending the evening with us here at Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time. Mmm. -hmm.